The fall color palette is one of my favorites. You have those nice neutrals, but then you have like jewel tones and like the deep wine reds and golden oranges and yellows. And so I love this time of year. And there are of course, gemstones that align with a fall color palette. And we are gonna talk about those today. All right, let's see what fall colors we have in store in this box. Sounds good. Oh, oh we've got some dark orange, or maybe a little bit of reddish brown. So we've done a lot of color episodes and you guys have really loved them. We've covered green and black and purple and red and blue. And we wanted to cover two kind of similar but different colors in one episode orange and brown. So a lot of gemstones that are brown can sometimes have that like reddish orange, yellowish orange, orangey color to them. So we thought we would combine them into one episode. You know, we're based in Knoxville, Tennessee. So a lot of people here are um, uh, Vol fans. So we, we knew we had to give orange its day. So let's talk about the zircon here. In terms of this mineral specimen, there are a few things that indicate to us that this is zircon. So one, the color. Zircon is known for having that orangish brownish hue. Second, the luster. So you can tell this this has a subadamantine luster on its surface. So that is in reference to the surface polish and it's really bright and reflective. Zircon is also really dense. It has a high specific gravity. And probably when you hold that and when I hold this, it's pretty heavy. So you can do something called a heft test, which is it's kind of subjective, but if you hold it in your hand and kind of toss it, and you're familiar with the heft of certain gemstones, you can gauge it's a little bit heavier oh, than you would think for its size. The other indicator here that it's zircon is its crystal habit. So zircon is in the tetragonal crystal system, and you're often going to see these bipyramidal structures, but kind of truncated. So uh, the rectangular prism that um, forms the middle part of the crystal is often a little bit flattened, and then you have the pyramidal terminations at the end. So that has an amazing crystal form. I love that piece. Oh yeah, it's beautiful. And you can probably see zircon is known for its intense doubling. It's highly doubly refractive. And so when you look in it, it looks kind of fuzzy. Zircons are kind of common-ish around the world. Um, a lot of times when they're mined, they're from alluvial deposits. They can be heat treated to uh, some other different colors. A lot of people like blue uh, for zircons. It's a heat treatment in a, I think it's a reducing atmosphere for that. And uh, I think it's six, hundred to a thousand degrees Celsius. But overall, even just natural zircon with its red-brown colors is just a lovely fall color. It's a six and a half to a seven, more or less, on the Mohs hardness scale. Zircon is one of the oldest gemstones that have been found on the Earth. Um, a lot of the times it's been used for dating because within the chemical composition within zircon, there's uh, radioactive elements like uh, thorium and uranium. Scientists have used uh, the decay rate for each of those elements because each one is different in their decay rate to date how old, kind of like when these zircons were formed, like a long time ago, like billions of years, which is pretty cool. <laughs> You ready for number two? Ready for number two. Oh, I love this gem. So this is a really fun one. This is an Oregon sunstone fasted by Daryl Alexander, who's a famous lapidary. Oregon sunstone is a variety of feldspar. The feldspar group is a really complex group. It's, it's really special because it's famous for metallic platelets that are common inclusions. Those metallic platelets are typically made of copper and they create an effect called aventurescence, but it's essentially this like glittery wave that comes over, over the gem as you turn it in light. A lot of lapidaries play, like use this to their advantage. And so they play with this optical phenomenon to create really beautiful stones that best display the adventure essence. 
So the more copper inclusions that it has within the feldspar, the more, you know, deeper orange color that it will be. The reason why it was called Oregon Sunstone is when it was first found, people thought that that was the only locality for this particular type of sunstone, but it has been found in, you know, other localities since then. Hopefully it's something nice. It's something nice. Oh, look at that. It's a big stone, yeah. so it has to be one where it's possible to be found in or like it can grow in bigger quantities. The main body color is like this brownish orange, but like if you look more along the body, it's kind of a little bit like a reddish orange, mm -hmm. a little bit. A strong red. Strong reddish orange, which is pretty cool. Potentially have one guess in mind. I have a guess. Two, three, two, one? Yeah, I love those. All right, <laughs> three, two, one, topaz. topaz. The other reason why I would think it would be imperial topaz is because the way that topaz forms is typically like in long, like slender crystals. Mm -hmm. And so you often get longer fasted gems, often emerald cuts, but this oval um, makes sense to me as well. So imperial topaz, also November's birthstone, one of November's birthstones, is, is one of the most prized varieties of topaz. It's typically mined in Oro Preto, Brazil. It's known for that rich, golden, orangish, reddish orange, yellowish orange hue, and it's certainly uh, the most valued type of topaz. And topaz, being one of the great minerals to wear for jewelry, is an eight on the Mohs hardness scale. Higher than quartz, lower than corundum, so with, of ruby and sapphire, but still really, really great. Let's talk about how it gets its color. <laughs> yes, so most of like orangish brown topazes get their color from chromium, specifically from their color centers, so at specific crystal structure defects that causes or well, it just kind of interacts with the chromium where that body color becomes the basis of the gemstone. All right, we've got more boxes. Oh my gosh, yes. I'm so, so excited. excited. I love, ooh. That is nice. Ooh, I know what these are. Dude. Immediately because that fire, the luster, the fire. Okay, Brittany, tell us what gemstone this is. So these are natural yellowish orange diamonds, which super cool, super cool. You know, diamond has a dispersion value of 0 0.044, so they're pretty dispersive. You can see the fire, the spectral colors. You can see some like red, some greenish blues in there, of course, yellow and orange. So that's really cool to see. And again, the luster is adamantine luster, so very bright and reflective. So for orange color of diamond and natural orange color of diamond, kind of a little bit of both of nitrogen and the deformation that's going on in the diamond. It's not like completely known the exact process, the exact process specifically for orange diamond, but on the atomic level, when the structure of the diamond is being deformed combined with, you know, a little bit of nitrogen impurities is where you can get potential orange color for diamond. All right. Oh, ooh, got some bright color going on here. This is Spessartine Garnet, named after the Spessart Mountains in Bavaria, which is where it was first founded. It's a really nice, like, cognac color that Nice, like deep orange-ish. I very, love that. Very, very honey yeah. color. 4.59 carats, mined in Tanzania. So again, it was first found in Bavaria, but Spessartine garnet is found in multiple localities throughout the world. The garnet group is a super complex group. So Spessartine is one of the few that's actually an idi idiochromatic gemstone. There are lots of different colors when it comes to garnet because of the isomorphous series that it's in. But for spessor type garnets, they get the main body color from manganese, which is pretty cool. It's not an allochromatic gemstone, meaning that with no impurities involved, it would be just like a colorless gemstone. All right, this one's for you. All righty. Ooh. 
Now this is a fun one. And honestly, I don't know, has this ever been on the channel before? It's a nice reddish orange called Triplight. So these are mined in Pakistan, about two and a half and three and a half carat weight. Really, really nice color. I love that reddish orange. It's really fiery and it's it has like a warm glow to it. It's also really neat seeing some of these larger carat weights for these and probably why it's in the president's collection is triplite is, I would say, pretty hard to try to facet because why it was named triplite is that it has three perfect cleavages along with it being brittle and very low on the most hardness scale. So it's it's got a lot going against it of if you want to try to facet triplite. A box, a box, a box. Ooh. Oh. All right. So we've got some corundum, orange sapphire. So we've talked a lot about corundum on this channel. Of course, corundum AL203 can be a lot of different colors. It can be practically all colors of the rainbow. All colors of corundum are sapphire, except for red, which is ruby. And so you have orange sapphire. These lovely orange colors in sapphire come from iron and chromium impurities, kind of mixing in together, which happens to be the second most rarest variety of corundum. Corundum's a nine out of 10 on the most scale of hardness. So a lot of people use um, corundum in everyday jewelry. That's why you'll see that as an alternate engagement ring. The other cool thing about these is they're untreated. So sapphires are often heat treated and they're treated for other reasons to improve color or clarity. And these are not treated. So this color is completely natural. What's in the box? Who knows? Um, what's in the box? What's in the box? Ooh. Oh, some big stuff is in the box. Oh my gosh, this is such a fun gemstone. So these are sphalerite from the Greek Phalaros, meaning treacherous. These are obviously quite large faceted pieces. This one is over 61 carats. That one is almost 95 carats. Known for its really high dispersion, so it has a higher dispersion value than diamond, and the practical effect of that is uh, something called fire. So it's that display of spectral color. And you can see in this, I mean, it literally looks like a kaleidoscope from back here. Oh, you can wow. see r like bright red, bright green, bright blue, bright yellow, bright orange. It's incredible. I love, I love that effect. So it's about a three and a half to four on the most scale of hardness. It has perfect cleavage in six directions. So those are two aspects that really affect its durability and make it really difficult for faceting. So to have faceted sphalerite and at this size and in such a well form is really spectacular. So sphalerite was named in 1847 for the Greek word sphaleros, meaning treacherous, because oftentimes they were looking for galena, but um, there's no no lead here, so they were sadly mistaken. That's Let's the big box. Show me this box. Ooh. Oh, that All right. is a fun one. So this is wolfenite. Wolfenite has a really complex chemical composition. As you can see, it can range from this a yellowish brown color to a really bright orange. Uh, this year in Tucson, there was a ton of wolfenite. Um, and again, it's anything from this yellowish orange to reddish to brown. So it can it, also be in green as well. Yeah, it, and it definitely fits into our fall color palette. Wolfenite is really easily recognizable because of these uh, like flat tabular crystals. So you can see in all three of these specimens, you have these like twinned tablets of rectangles or some are squares, and they're kind of layered on top of one another. This one, the, the tablets are a little bit more bladed than the others. Yeah. Wolfenite is often found in the oxidation zones of lead ore deposits, and so you're, you'll often find it in association with lead. So here, it's actually a pretty 
hefty mineral. Metallics have a higher specific gravity than most gem materials. It's not often that you'll find fasted gems of wolfenite because their hardness is relatively low. I mean, it's, it's a three on the hardness scale. So, I mean, it's about as hard as calcite. Their shape, even though we see these kind of like tabular habits, um, it's actually in the tetragonal crystal system. So I've heard for this last box that most of the specimens couldn't fit in our large box. So we're just gonna have it out here on the table in three, two, one. Hey! Wow! <laughs> okay, so this is selenite, which is a form of gypsum. Not very durable. Oh, not at all. Especially this one. I really like that one. I think that like that nice like mocha caramel type of color is really pleasing to the eye. The form is super cool. You have a desert rose over there. So that's a popular form of selenite. And so they often form in rosettes or this rose color. And so it's named as such. That guy looks like a little hedgehog. So selenite is about a one and a half to two on the most scale of hardness, so not very hard at all. It has perfect cleavage in multiple directions, and when it gets exposed to heat, it becomes cloudy. And so that's why you get this kind of like milky brownish color. So it's really phenomenal that you have specimens of this size and of this form still intact because they are quite fragile. So it's really important to take good care of them. So selenite is a hydrous calcium sulfate. It's often found in deserts. Some of these are from the United States, like in places like Oklahoma. So they they look a little bit parched, I'm not gonna lie. I think even though they're hydrous calcium sulfates, they look like they could use a little bit of hydration. So for my closer look, I'm going to choose this sphalerite. Sphalerite is one of my favorite gemstones. I think the hardness, the cleavage planes, the dispersion, the luster just make it super interesting to me. And I just love that nice golden color. That's a really, really great pick. This particular uh, piece of wolfenite, just because when you often see wolfenite, it, it's in the tabbed form, but these it has the combination of both like these spheres that are going on down here and uh, where you can see its actual crystal system form. So I think I might've convinced myself that I, I would like to take a closer look at this one. Thanks for joining our brown and orange color episode. Uh, tell us, have we missed any other colors? We've done a lot of other ones, so go check out those and let us know in the comments if you wanna see any other colors. And don't forget to like, subscribe, ring that bell if you really want to. And we hope you have enjoyed our episode of Orange and Brown Gems. See you next time.